myself, Professor Shormishtha Panja. I teach at the Department of English, University of Delhi, and by Manila Kohli, Assistant Professor in the Department of English, Shamlal College, University of Delhi. In this MOOC, we will tell you about the Renaissance, give an idea of the intellectual climate of the Renaissance. We will tell you about Shakespeare's life and times. We will take you through the four major genres of Shakespeare's plays, tragedies, comedies, history plays, and romances. And we will also include student performances of scenes from Shakespeare's plays, followed by panel discussions. We include interviews with international experts on global Shakespeare as well as lectures on Indian adaptations of Shakespeare on stage. We hope that you will greatly enjoy and benefit from this MOOC, The Renaissance and Shakespeare. Thank you. In this MOOC, we will first begin by talking about the Renaissance the intellectual climate of the Renaissance, the major thinkers, both Italian and British. We will talk about the Renaissance in the North, science in the Renaissance, the visual arts in the Renaissance, the position of women in the Renaissance, and also how the Renaissance traveled from Italy to England. We will also say a few words about Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer, two major writers of the English Renaissance. Hello, my name is Professor Shormish Thapanja and I'm going to talk to you today about the Renaissance. 
Now, there are a number of misnomers about the Renaissance. The fact that there was this sudden rebirth of classical learning, that there was no knowledge of the classics in the medieval period. The medieval period was a period called the Dark Ages. This is not true. Authors like Aristotle and Virgil were known in the Middle Ages, but what happened in the Renaissance as a result of the discovery of a number of new manuscripts, including the works of Plato, uh, that were discovered after the sack of Constantinople and which were brought to Italy by people like Giovanni Orispa, who rescued no fewer than 238 manuscripts. Uh, as a result of these, there was a new kind of knowledge of the classics available in the Renaissance. This knowledge was put to different uses than it had been in the Middle Ages. There wasn't that emphasis on scholasticism anymore. And there was an emphasis on literature, on history, and there was a critical approach to this classical heritage, which we didn't have in the Middle Ages. What I'm showing you now is a contemporary uh, visual of uh, the fall of Constantinople, the sack of Constantinople, modern Istanbul in 1453. This is a French miniature. Uh, now, the Renaissance in Italy, this is where it moved. Now, you have to remember that Italy was not a national or a unified country. It was a collection of city-states. Why did it move to Italy? Uh, in Italy, people thought that they had a link to the classical past through the Roman Empire, through authors like Virgil. It was also fueled by the enormous wealth of families like the Medici, a banking family in Florence, great patrons of art, the Sforza family in Milan, the Roveres, the people from Venice, the Papal States, the, the Pope who was of course a huge mentor of art and literature. And the Renaissance in Italy grew up from urban centers, all right? It was a city-fueled movement. Uh, this is a map of Italy. And remember, this is not Italy as a nation, but Italy as a connection of states, a collection of states that consider themselves independent, OK? Whether it be Milan, whether it be Florence, whether it be Naples, uh, this is Italy. Now, one of the key words for the Renaissance is, of course, humanism. Now, what does humanism mean? Humanism means that there is an emphasis on the individual, on the human being, not on God. Remember in the Middle Ages, life on earth was a preparation for life either in heaven or hell. That's no longer the case. Life on earth, human beings become enormously important in the, in the Renaissance as a result of humanism. This de-emphasizes medieval scholastic learning and emphasizes instead language, literature, history, ethics. And classical literature, the study of both Latin and Greek Latin classical literature is on the rise. But there's also the rise of the vernaculars. That's very important. Italian literature, Tuscan literature, English literature. These uh, take place or, you know, uh, in the Renaissance. And as I said before, the end of learning uh, is to lead a good life, to make uh, an honorable and ethical individual and also to become a better citizen. Is this man called Petra? Petra, his dates are 1304-1374. He's called the father of humanism, lived to the ripe old age of 70. He initiated this uh, sort of course of uh, humanistic study called the Studia Humanitatis. He stresses the need for eloquence, but he also uses the vernacular. He writes sonnets in Italian, not in Latin or in Greek. That's very important. One of the major letters that he writes is called the Ascent to Mount Vontu. He writes this around 1350, and it's addressed to one of his former confessors. And it's a sort of prototypical Renaissance document. Why? Because he's talking about himself. The focus is on the self. He discusses theology, he discusses classical texts, he refers to Augustine, for example, Augustine's Confessions. Uh, he also looks upon his climb up the mountain as an allegorical journey, uh, as one's journey through life. He takes the wrong way three times, he says, while his brother laughs at him. And also, it is, uh, you know, the importance of sort of reaching your goal, of being ethical, of being a learned person, 
who also contemplates and looks within. This is what finds expression in the ascent to Mount Ventoux. And Petrarch is a sort of major exponent of what was called the Vita Contemplativa, the contemplative life, the inward life, the person who looks within. Another person who does this, and I'll just show you a portrait of uh, Petrarch, that's Petrarch there is Pico della Mirandola, 1463 to 1494, only lived to be 31. But what's amazing about Pico is that not only is he combining the strands of Platonism and Christianity, but he's also looking at other religions. He's looking at the Hebrew heritage. He's looking at the Muslim heritage. He's showing this enormous breadth of mind of not being just confined to Florence, but looking at the world and talking in terms of a world culture. This is very important. Okay, And what we also have in Pico's famous oration on the dignity of man, which was published in 1486 when he was just 24 years old, is this sense of tremendous optimism. God looks at the human being and he says, we have made thee neither of heaven nor of earth, neither mortal nor immortal, so that with freedom of choice and with honor, as though the maker and molder of thyself, thou mayest fashion thyself in whatever shape thou shalt prefer. Look at these words, fashion thyself, very important. Freedom of choice, very important. See, we are worlds away from the medieval notion of God determining whether you're going to be a sinner or whether you're going to be saved. You now, as a Renaissance individual, have the freedom to fashion your own life. The other important point that Pico makes is that the human being is like a chameleon. He calls him the human chameleon. The human being can either rise to the level of angels or sink to the level of beasts. So this tenuousness, this flexibility in human nature, human nature is not fixed, that is Pico's vital contribution to the notion of the human being in the Renaissance. And that's a portrait of Pico there. Another important branch of humanism was what's called civic humanism. Remember I told you that not gnosis but praxis must be the fruit. Learning must be put to good use. So civic humanism with the help of people like Leonardo Bruni and Leon Battista Alberti talk about the need of the citizen. Okay, they also say that it's quite all right to be ambitious. It's quite all right to pursue earthly glory. It's quite all right to fulfill your complete potential here on earth. These are very important things. And remember that both Bruni and Alberti are what we now call Renaissance men. Okay, Bruni is not only a historian, writes a history of Florence, but he also translates Plato and Aristotle into Latin. Very, very important. Plato wasn't available to the Western world before this. Okay, uh, he also writes biographies in Italian. So he emphasizes the vernacular along with classical learning. He writes biographies of Dante and Petrarch. So in other words, he is upholding the role of poets. Poets are seen as very important to the human community. Alberti is an architect, a diplomat, an art theorist, a sociologist. He writes the first theory of art and the first sociological treatise on the family, where he stresses the importance of the nuclear family. So they're saying that one must serve the state. They use Florence, their hometown, as a model. And they are the ones who are talking about the merits of the active life, vita, Activa. Petrarch stands for Vita Contemplativa, Alberti and Bruni and Lorenzo Valla stand for the for Vita Activa. And I'll just show you this is Bruni and this is Alberti. Now Baldassare Castiglione, his dates are 1478 and 1529, he is also a very good example of a good citizen, all right? He lived for 51 years. The Book of the Courtier was published in 1528. Hobie's English translation came out in 1561 and just about every English author of importance refers to this book. So it was one of the best sellers of its time. Now note the number of masters that Castiglione has had. He served Sforza, he served the Duke of Urbino, he served Rovere, he served the Pope, he has served all these successive employers successfully. 
all right but actually he was snobbish he married for money he was fastidious he wasn't a very nice man but in spite of that when he died uh the the emperor charles the 5th said one of the finest gentlemen in the world is dead now why did he say this because castiglione puts to practice what he preaches in the courtier what does he say in the courtier in the courtier he is talking about the art of double speak the art of self presentation which goes hand in hand with self preservation he says ideal should never interfere with the life of politics the world is not a world of absolute values but of contingent values you do what is right at that particular time and he gives examples of uh you know the really arbitrary world of violence that was italian city state politics but he does it in such a smooth and mellow way that you don't even know that you're looking upon a world of such violence he says it may not be evil to kill even 1000 people if your prince has asked you to do so all right so you know he's talking about the difference between appearance and reality he's talking about the world of politics real politics which is very different from the kind of idealized world where the virtuous are always rewarded and the evil are always punished he also steers away from contemporary examples and only gives examples from ancient history thereby also protecting himself you know you understand from any charges of of favoritism or whatever uh he coins new words like sprezzatura he says i'm using a new word this has now become a renaissance cliche what is sprezzatura sprezzatura is a sort of nonchalance it's a way of presenting yourself with artful artlessness all right so you actually the way you're presenting yourself disguises a lot of labor but you don't show any of that labor you just present yourself as this sort of you know god made uh, wonder the role of women in the courtier is very very important crucial characters in the courtier are uh, elizabetta gonzaga the countess and emilia pia her her, her uh, close relative these are the women who initiate the discussion these are the women who prick the balloon of male rhetoric you know like when pietro bembo perorates on love emilia pia cracks a joke and brings everybody down to earth so what we have in uh, the world of the courtier which is based on four evenings where this sort of group of very you know well bred people get together and talk about what it means to be a perfect courtier all right the form of the work is very important because they are gracefully talking at each other uh, talking to each other cracking jokes uh, making very you know sophisticated fun of each other uh because through the form of the work castiglione is telling us about the substance of the work you know this is how uh, a courtier must behave so the subtle skills of the courtier are not the kinds of skills that a medieval knight needed a courtier is a combination of the medieval knight and the modern politician he is a social being all right he has to interact and live and succeed in society he can't be a loner on a quest like the like the medieval knight okay so um this urban this witty this sort of very graceful and learned conversation that we find in the courtier uh, is what uh, is what being a courtier in the renaissance is all about and this is actually based on castiglione's own experiences in the court of urbino where elisabetta gonzaga was the countess this is a superb portrait one of the best portraits that we have in the italian renaissance by raphael of castiglione and look at that face look at how much is concealed in that face and how little it reveals that is the core of the courtier now nicolo machiavelli 1469 15 27 one of the most original minds in the renaissance but was he a thundering success like castiglione no he wasn't why because he didn't try to disguise the truth he didn't try to tell the truth covertly he always spoke clearly and he demystified politics to such an extent that he was seen as dangerous and he found it very hard 
to find patrons. His prints came out in 1532 and that's where he says things like, you know, the end justifies the means between the fox and the lion, the prince should model himself on the clever fox rather than the magnanimous lion. Cesare Borgia, one of the villains of history, is Machiavelli's hero because he's a very effective administrator. So what Machiavelli is saying is really not very different from what Castiglione is saying. But the way in which he says it is so very different that he is seen as dangerous, whereas Castiglione is, uh, is fetid. So this dangerous demystification of politics, of saying everything exactly as it is, that is Machiavelli's uh, sort of, you know, core quality. And of course, the prince is addressed directly to the prince, whereas Castiglione's courtier is addressed to a member of the court, the courtier. This is a portrait of Machiavelli. Now, the Renaissance in the north was very different from the Renaissance in the south in Italy. Uh, Erasmus is the leading figure of the Renaissance in the north, the legitimate son of a prince, uh, of a priest, sorry, in Rotterdam. But he was a true sort of citizen of Europe. His dates are circa 1467 to 1536, lived for 69 years, had friends all across the continent. Sir Thomas More in England was a very close friend. And his major work, his life's work, was a Latin translation of the Greek New Testament with a commentary. Why was this so crucial? Remember that the Bible was read earlier only by priests. In the Middle Ages, the common person couldn't just pick up the Bible and read it. Erasmus makes the Bible available to, uh, uh, you know, the, the man on the street, the average person. All right. Uh, the Renaissance in the North is much more religious, less secular than, than the Renaissance in Italy. It's non-urban. It's not built around city-states. Values are not seen as relative or contingent. And Erasmus also writes these marvelous colloquies. And of course, his masterpiece, The Praise of Folly, where he uses irony and never speaks in his own voice. And what is ironic is that Erasmus's Greek New Testament, the translation of it, makes possible uh, the rise of Protestantism. But actually Erasmus was an enemy of Protestantism. He didn't believe in Protestantism and he has all these, you know, sort of arguments with Luther about it. But it is his erudition that makes the Bible available to millions more than it was available to earlier. Uh, this is a beautiful portrait of Erasmus by Holbein. Just a few words about Renaissance art. These are the major artists, Masaccio, Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo and Raphael. Masaccio's dates are 1401 to possibly 1427. Uh, this is the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise, circa 1425. This is a fresco, part of the famous Brancacci frescoes. Now, how is Masaccio changing medieval art? He is making the bodies a lot more solid. They were elongated uh, in uh, medieval art. They're much more recognizably human in Masaccio's uh, hands. And look at that expression of Eve, you know, uh, Munch probably remembered it when he painted the screen many centuries later. Look at the realism of Eve's horror as she realizes that she can never go back through those narrow gates back into paradise. All right. So that psychological realism is something that along with the solidity of the bodies that Masaccio is introducing, this is Botticelli's Primavera or Spring, circa 1482, uh, an allegory because you have Zephyr there uh, who's impregnating Chloris the nymph who then turns into Flora, the goddess of flowers, that's Venus in the center, the three graces and Mercury and Cupid on top. Okay, so beautifully drawn figures, the importance of the human body in the Renaissance. We can see in the paintings of Botticelli, as well as a certain Neoplatonism, a tendency towards allegory. Leonardo da Vinci's Virgin and Child with Saint Anne, 1510. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci produced very few complete paintings. He was constantly reworking his paintings, never satisfied. Look at the marvelous way in which he's dealing with the problem of placing two adult figures and a child in the same frame. What does he do? He seats the Virgin Mary in the lap 
of her mother, Saint Anne, who's the Virgin's mother. And you can see that Saint Anne, look at the psychological realism, has eyes not for Christ, the Christ child, but for her own daughter, the Virgin Mary. All right, whereas the Virgin is reaching out to the child who is already pulling away from her because he has a life to lead and he's embracing that lamb which represents Christianity, which represents Christ's flock. And this is uh, Michelangelo's masterpiece, The Last Judgment, a detail of it in the Sistine Chapel, 1536 to 1541, are the years that it took Michelangelo to complete this. He is painting frescoes when he's actually trained as a sculptor and a painter. He says, I've been given a commission to do work that I'm not familiar with. And look what he produces. Now, The Last Judgment is amazing because it combines the secular and the spiritual, which is a very important trait in Renaissance art. So the figure of Christ in the middle is actually modeled on uh, uh, Apollo. Okay, the, the figure is modeled on the classical Apollo. And right here above the altar, you have the gates of hell opening and you have Charon, the boatman, rowing the dead souls on the river Styx. Now see, these are all from classical myth. These are not part of Christian myth. But he is combining the figures of Christ, Mary, St. John the Baptist with classical elements. And on this side you have the blessed and on that side you have the damned. And this flayed skin is none other than Michelangelo himself. So he positions himself among the damned. And the only sort of heartening thing about this is that Christ faces the damned. Even though he has raised his hand to chastise them, he faces the damned. Renaissance science. Now, uh, you know, we think that how can there possibly have been science in the Renaissance? This is not true. What we call the Copernican Revolution is brought about by three people. A po Polish clergyman, Copernicus, 1473 to 1543. An Italian scientist, Galileo, 1564 to 1642. And Kepler, a German mystical thinker, 1571 to 1630. So the work of all three of these make possible the Copernican Revolution and they paved the way for modern concepts like skepticism, infinity of time and space, mechanism. Copernicus's famous book on the revolution of the heavenly spheres which was completed in 1530 but published only in 1543. Why? This is a clergyman who, is, who knows that he's going to upset the way people think about the universe as a result of his discoveries. All right, so he puts off publishing this till 1543, which is also the year he dies. And he is the man who says that the planets do not move around the earth, they move around the sun. Just think of that. Just think of what a huge sort of, uh, you know, comment, a statement this was to make. It completely made the whole Renaissance world uh, go topsy-turvy. All right, so the universe was not earth centric, it was heliocentric. And Kepler says that, you know, God creates the universe according to mathematical laws, not just, you know, doesn't just wake up one morning and create the world. The planets move in elliptical and not circular orbits. And of course, Galileo's telescope, which, uh, you know, he sees the moons of Jupiter for the first time, the rings of Saturn, and measures the enormous distance of fixed stars. And these are the portraits. This is. Polish clergyman, a Copernicus, a Polish clergyman, Kepler, the German mystical thinker, and Galileo carrying his telescope, the Italian scientist.